Hi, uh, I'm Dobbin Chow. I'm the uh, program director for the University of Maryland Medical Center Midtown Campus the Transitional Year Program and Internal Medicine Program. I'm also uh, uh, honored to serve as the chair of medicine in the Department of Medicine at the uh, University of Maryland Medical Center Midtown. So uh, I want to thank you for your interest in our Transitional Year Program. Uh, this is a, a unique uh, year and uh, normally, you would be coming to our, our, our hospital, uh, you would have breakfast, uh, I would give you this uh, overview, uh, uh, you would uh, then go on uh, some interviews with faculty, uh, you'd have new conference with the residents, eat lunch with the residents, uh, then you would have a debriefing session with residents, go on a tour, that would be the day. Uh, and you'd have a chance to to uh, to to look the residents in the eye, uh, you have a chance to walk around the hospital, open up the closets, do whatever it is you need to do to get a full understanding of our of our hospital. Um, so I'm sorry, uh, I, we're not able to uh, provide you with that experience. Um, so, uh, in, in in addition to this uh, overview, um, which will be somewhat detailed. Uh, you'll also have a, a, a virtual tour uh, by some of our residents. Uh, and then uh, one of our chief residents uh, went on a uh, tour around the hospital. She interviewed some faculty. And so you can look at that uh, video as well. Uh, you have a chance to attend noon conference, albeit it'll be virtual. Probably the most important part of the day is you're going to have a debriefing session with residents. And uh, I'm going to encourage you to confront them, uh, ask them aggressive, probing, confrontational questions. Uh, and uh, that's, that session is really gonna be for you. Uh, nothing that you say uh, to them is gonna come back to us. We want you to be, um, feel at liberty to ask uh, any and all questions. Uh, so that you can get as close to as close as possible to a true understanding of uh, what goes on here. Um, look, the worst thing that could happen if you come here as a resident and then you say to yourself, gee, if I knew this, they had told us that, it would have made different decisions, that's a bad outcome. What we want to happen if you come here as a resident and you say to yourself, gee, that's what I expected, that's what I was told. Uh, and so that's a win-win scenario. Uh, uh, so, uh, I'm going to urge you to be, um, uh, be critical, um, make sure this program fits your needs, not you fitting into our needs. Make sure that, uh, this, um, uh, uh, make sure that your, uh, uh, concerns get addressed. Uh, and, uh, if it's a good fit, uh, great. Uh, if it's not, uh, then that's okay. But we want to be sure that you, uh, give it a good thought, give it a good consideration. So with that said, uh, let's go ahead and begin. Uh, make sure that uh, you, know, you all you know, get your cup of coffee in your hand. Um, if, relax. Uh, the, 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 you know, uh, yeah, put your feet up. Yeah, like yeah, I, I see you. And um, yeah, wear sneakers. That's fine. Um, all right. And we'll um, go ahead and get started. Um, so uh, this is a map of Baltimore, and uh, I don't know how familiar you all are with Baltimore. Um, uh, it's so we're um, we're we're lo located just south of Philadelphia. Uh, th th this uh, yellow line is the city limits. Uh, I ninety five goes north to Philadelphia. Uh, I ninety five south goes to Washington D.C. Eighty three goes northwest uh, to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. It looks for all the world like we're located at the confluence of these highways. It looks for all the world like we're located downtown, uh, but we're not. We're located uh, in this region called Midtown, and uh, this is uh, our hospital. This is I-83, which goes off to the northwest. Uh, these apartment buildings are uh, locations where residents have lived in the past. Uh, this region is called Mount Vernon. It's a popular area of town. Uh, there's two college campuses there. Uh, one is uh, uni uh, is a 
Maryland Institute College for Art, MICA, uh, which is in their campus is located in this area. It's a well-known art school. It's been there for probably a hundred years. And, um, and then University of Baltimore is located in this area here. So a lot of young people in this area and uh, a popular place to live. And pe people who live in these apartments can then walk uh, to the hospital. Now, um, this is the Amtrak train station and uh, it's within, within walking distance of the hospital. It's less than a mile. And uh, people can commute to the hospital by, by train. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's a local train, so it's not Amtrak, it's called Mark. And uh, it uh, and people people use Mark Train to commute to Washington D.C. Um, for those who work in D.C. Um, now uh, there are some people who like to live in the suburbs, and uh, Baltimore has uh, one subway line called the Metro. It starts in the northwest suburb of Owens Mills. The terminal station is in the east, right in uh, Johns Hopkins Hospital. And uh, we're one block away from a metro stop, which is right uh, here. Uh, in addition, Baltimore has one surface trolley, which runs north-south. The northmost uh, uh, station is in a suburb called Hunt Valley. The terminal station is right in the airport. And we're one block away from the light rail stop. So people can commute to the hospital by public transportation, or uh, they can uh, live nearby. Now, downtown Baltimore, and we're about um, a mile and a quarter away from the downtown, uh, is dominated by this body of water called the Inner Harbor. Uh, it's a popular area, especially in the summertime, a lot of activities going on. It's a tourist destination. Uh, this here is the uh, National Aquarium, a popular uh, tourist destination. So in this downtown area, there's um, a lot of um, uh, restaurants and clubs and other distractions from our resident studies in the downtown area. This area of Midtown is known for the arts. Uh, our back door of the hospital uh, backs up to the, uh, to the Meyerhoff Symphony Hall, uh, which is uh, located here. It's a wonderful venue for music. This is the inside of the Meyerhoff. Each summer, there's a big festival. Well, it didn't happen this year, first time in many years that we didn't have Art Fest. It's supposed to be the country's largest art fair. Uh, it's a crazy week. Uh, they closed down all the streets around our hospital. Uh, it's um, the, 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 the people come from all over. Uh, I told one of my friends that I'm coming to this hospital to work. And they said, yay, we finally have parking for Art Fest. Uh, those are the kind of friends I have. Uh, this is Micah, Maryland Institute College for Art. Um, the Walters Art Gallery is an art uh, museum, which is about three blocks to the east of us. Uh, Lyric Performing Arts Center is uh, three blocks just to our north. And uh, so this area of Mount Vernon uh, pictured here is the place where a lot of uh, residents live and there's apartment buildings along this street, which is called Charles Street and runs north south. Um, this is the Washington Monument. I heard they built another Washington, Washington Monument down in DC. Could be wrong about that. So this building uh, right here, this white colored building is this built. This is the inside of that building, which is the Peabody Library. Uh, it's fa it's a, a it's a, quite a sight. It's like uh, the uh, inside of a, a Harry Potter building, um, and a lot of restaurants in the uh, Mount Washington area. Um, I try to focus the resident evening activities on this venue, uh, which is the University of Maryland. School of Medicine Library. It's uh, open late, uh, plenty of seating, not been an easy sell. But uh, our, our residents all have access to the library and uh, they uh, take advantage of it, especially because it has a, a very comprehensive set of holdings. Now, um, let me uh, try to get you caught up about what is University of Maryland Medical Center Midtown Campus. How does it relate to University of Maryland? And to do that requires a bit of a walk through history. Uh, so this hospital was formerly known as Maryland General Hospital, the original MGH. And it was a, it's a 200 bed community hospital built over a hundred years ago. And it's been the same location 
and it's proud to serve this local community. Uh, it's a diverse community. Uh, there's a neighborhood to the north called uh, Bolton Hill. Uh, many people associated with the arts uh, live in that neighborhood. The uh, art school is embedded in that neighborhood. Um, it, in addition, there is a set of uh, state office buildings located just to our northwest. The, um, the metro stop uh, is right in the middle of the state office buildings. Um, and the state office workers will uh, utilize our campus for their health care. They utilize our cafeteria for lunch, which doesn't say much about their cafeteria. And then there's neighborhoods to the west and to the southwest. Um, these are uh, neighborhoods uh, which are largely underserved, uh, patients suffering uh, with uh, social economic challenges, and we're privileged and honored to serve those communities. So a very uh, diverse set of communities in this hospital, I'm proud to serve those communities over the years. Uh, the 1980s was a challenging decade for hospitals throughout the country. The reason for that is because in uh, 1984, the uh, uh, Medicare uh, changed its reimbursement paradigm. Up until 1983, uh, you were paid on a fee-for-service basis, meaning you provided care to a patient, uh, you sent that bill to Medicare for that service, Medicare paid the bill, and times were good. Then starting in 1984, medical, uh, Medicare began to pay for diagnoses. Uh, so if you admitted a patient to the hospital with heart failure, you get one sum of money, and uh, whether you kept the patient in the hospital for two days or kept in the hospital for two weeks, you only have that one sum of money. So this was a very challenging uh, uh, change and hospitals around the country had difficulty uh, dealing with it as did our hospital. At the same time, there was a change in the demographics of all the cities along the East Coast. People were moving out of the uh, uh, cities and moving to the suburbs, flight to the suburbs. This is a social economic phenomenon happened in Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Washington, DC, happened here in Baltimore. And so there was a suburb in the North that uh, did not have a hospital, but it was uh, booming, a tremendous growth there. So the board of directors of our hospital said, gee, let's move out there. We could do really well. Uh, booming community, great demographics, good payer mix. So they, uh, uh, they purchased a 10 acre plot of land on top of a hill uh, they drafted up architectural plans to build a brand new hospital. I've seen the plans are so detailed. You can see where the life sockets were going to go in each of the rooms. And for all the world, they were going to move. Then at the last minute, uh, the mayor of the city came, the, uh, the governor for the state of Maryland came to our hospital and they said, gee, what's going to happen to these patients if you all leave? And the board of directors came to realize you know, we, we have deep roots here. We have a commitment to these communities. They decided to stay. And, and so the hospital struggled along, um, it, it, hoping for better times, but it wasn't to be. And the 1990s was yet a more challenging decade for hospitals around this country. Uh, this was during President Clinton's administration. Now, when President Clinton took office, uh, one of the first things he did was to uh, try to pass a healthcare reform bill. Uh, it, uh, it did not pass, uh, but uh, his uh, efforts uh, did uh, lead, his efforts uh, did help um, President Obama uh, and a lot of the tenets in President Obama's health care reform bill originated uh, from President Clinton. But what President Clinton did do was able to pass bills that promoted the growth of large payer organizations, HMOs. And uh, what HMOs uh, did uh, was to uh, enroll tens of thousands of patients into large panels. And then the HMO, HMO will go knock on the doors of hospitals and say, gee, if one of our patients gets admitted to your hospital, this is what we're going to pay you. And uh, if you were the, the chief financial officer of that hospital, you would look at that pay rate, that pay scale, and you would say, whoa, I can't do business with those kinds of rates. And the HMO would say, well, thank you very much. We're going to go to this hospital. Now that's, the, and so if you can imagine, if you were the, on the board of directors of this hospital, 
And if you said no to the HMO, the HMO would just go one mile to the east, knock, knock on the door of Mercy Hospital. If Mercy Hospital said no, uh, then the HMO would go one mile to the west uh, and uh, knock on the door of Bon Secure Hospital or uh, four miles to the north, Sinai Hospital. So uh, in, the, in, in cities um, in which there are a, a, a lot of uh, hospital options for HMOs, it was very challenging for hospitals uh, to, uh, to, to remain solvent because they were obliged to sign these adverse contracts. Consequently, many hospitals went in the red, uh, many closed, uh, many, some went bankrupt. How did hospitals respond? Well, they merged and consolidated. Up in Boston, for example, uh, Mass General merged with the Brigham. Now, up until that time, people from those two hospitals, they won't be caught dead in the same room. Now they're part of one uh, system, the Harvard plan. Uh, same thing happened in uh, New York and uh, I can't keep, it, it's still happening in New York. I can't keep track of all the hospitals and how they are realigning uh, and what systems they all belong to. It's mind boggling. Uh, but uh, same thing happened in Philadelphia at the beginning of that decade. At the beginning of that decade, there are about, I would say, 20 independent hospitals, most small, some large. And at the end of the decade, there are four hospital systems, the Penn system, the Jefferson system, the Temple Allegheny system, and then the Drexel system, although the Drexel system has uh, changed uh, recently uh, with the closing of Hahnemann. Um, and uh, so uh, how does that work? Well, uh, if you were in uh, HMO and you knocked on the door of Penn and said, here's our contract, and Penn said, uh, no, we're not gonna sign that contract. And Penn controls all the hospitals in West Philadelphia, yet the payer has a whole bunch of patients who live in West Philadelphia, yet if they get sick, they can't visit any of those hospitals. That doesn't work. So then the payer is obliged to negotiate with Penn and that's how these hospital systems were able to remain solvent. So same thing happened here in Baltimore. And this hospital became part of the University of Maryland system. All right, so let me tell you about University of Maryland. University of Maryland uh, is the medical school and the hospital. And the they were lo they're located in downtown Baltimore and they've been there for over 200 years. Um, now uh, they're owned by the state. And when the state uh, created the medical school, the charge to the medical school, medical school is to graduate doctors who will go out and practice and take care of the citizens of the state of Maryland. That they built the hospital and the charge to the hospital to take care of the citizens of the state of Maryland when they got sick. Well, that wasn't such a difficult charge back then because 200 years ago, most people who lived in Maryland lived right around Baltimore in the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, uh, and uh, the hospital can meet that mandate. Now people live all over the state and they have choices. You may have heard of another hospital four miles to east of us, uh, Johns Hopkins Hospital. People can choose to go there. So what did University of Maryland do? It began to acquire hospitals in strategic locations located all over the state. So if you go uh, 40 miles north on I-95 towards uh, Philadelphia, you'll you'll see a relatively brand new hospital uh, built maybe 10 years ago. Hmm. Yeah, about 10, 15 years ago called Upper Chesapeake Hospital. That's part of University of Maryland. Down by Baltimore Washington Airport, there's Baltimore Washington Hospital. That's part of University of Maryland. There's a suburb just uh, north of Baltimore called Towson. There's a, a large multi-specialty hospital called St. Joseph's Hospital. That's part of University of Maryland. If you go three hours due east from here, you'll fall in the ocean. Uh, but if you go two and a, about two hours due east, you'll be in this area called the Eastern Shore, which is a relatively rural area. And there's a hospital out there called Shore Regional Hospital. That's part of University of Maryland. Uh, in 2017, University of Maryland purchased Prince George's County Hospital, which is located in Maryland, but it's in Prince George's County, which is quite close to Washington, DC. So altogether now there's 13 hospitals in this big hospital system. And these hospitals are located in strategic locations all over the state. Uh, and, and the purpose is, purpose is be able to provide hospital care to people in the state of Maryland should they need it. And then if they need tertiary care, 
then those patients could be referred to the downtown medical center for tertiary care. And you're gonna say, oh, that's all nice. Sounds like a nice setup. What about this hospital? Small urban community hospital located less than one mile away from uh, the downtown medical center. What purpose does that serve? Well, as I mentioned, the medical center and the medical school have been located in the downtown location all these years. Uh, and like all medical centers, it wants to grow and expand, but it has difficulty doing so because of its downtown location. Um, it's, it's expensive to acquire uh, property and land in a downtown location uh, surrounded by private and business properties. So yet it still wants to grow and expand. So I'll give you an example of this. Um, shock trauma started out as four beds in the ICU. Shock trauma is this concept where if you experience trauma, uh, you uh, would get brought to a centralized location and get your trauma managed there. This was a novel and innovative concept. Until they developed shock trauma, if you experienced uh, trauma, you get brought to the hospital closest to where you had your accident, they would manage you. And then if you needed advanced trauma care, then you would get brought to the tertiary referral center. But by centralizing trauma services and making that site the first point of contact for patients with trauma, they're able to demonstrate improved clinical outcomes. Consequently, this model of centralized trauma care has been replicated in large metropolitan areas all over the country. Uh, uh, so now shock trauma, it's a hospital unto itself. It's adjacent to the main hospital. Uh, they had to knock down a, um, a, a, a set of buildings. Uh, they built a, a nice spanking new building, has a landing pad for the helicopter on the roof, has an elevator straight into the, into the ORs, has its own ICU, has its own wards, beautiful auditorium at the first floor, came at considerable taxpayer cost. The medical school also wanted to grow and expand. They bought a city block north of the medical school, knocked down all the buildings on that block, dug a huge hole in the ground, and they built this 27-story research building, beautiful building, uh, just got finished last year. It took about five years to build $120 million. Now, uh, the Department of Medicine downtown, they don't have those kinds of funds. So when the state purchased this hospital, the Maryland General Hospital, uh, the Department of Medicine saw this hospital as an opportunity to offload clinical services to this site. So what's happened is the uh, diabetes uh, clinic was moved up to this site. Endocrinology clinic moved to this site. Infectious diseases moved all four of its clinics up to this site. Pulmonary moved all its clinical services up to this site. And by uh, offloading clinical services to this site, the downtown site can continue to grow and expand. Then in 2015, the two sites formally merged and uh, they became one institution. Uh, they, uh, they have one now, one board of directors, there's one CEO, they oversee the two, uh, uh, the two campuses uh, with uh, one, uh, medical, one board of directors and one, um, uh, one academic faculty. Meanwhile, at this site, there's been tremendous growth. Uh, we serve now over 130,000 patients annually. That's inpatient and outpatient. Uh, they renovated the uh, ORs here, um, and uh, the ORs have become much busier here, and it's because of the s surgeries that were brought here from the surgeons who practice at the downtown campus. At the downtown campus, the ORs were uh, busy, they're congested, hard to get OR time, and uh, the surgeons found it's much easier to get OR time here in addition, the patients liked it because the patients get in and out of this site much easier than the downtown site. So these so the surgeons started booking their surgeries up here. And to accommodate this increased volume, uh, this hospital added a ninth OR about two years ago. It cost a million dollars to put in one OR. It must be the music system. Uh, they also renovated the ICU. The ICU is an 18-bed ICU, and it's run by the pulmonary critical care faculty from downtown. Now, there's uh, 65 pulmonary critical care faculty at downtown site. They could have said to each of them, all right, everyone has to do one week at the Midtown ICU once a year, we'll get it covered. Fortunately, they didn't do that. 
Instead, what they did was to identify a handful of pulmonary critical care specialists, and they become our pulmonary critical care specialists. They do about one week a month staffing our ICU, uh, and uh, they've become our pulmonary critical care faculty. They get to know our residents well. They know, get to know the nurses in the ICU well. They get to know the policies of the hospital. They serve on committees of the hospital. Uh, they've, um, they, they've become an integral member of our faculty. Uh, and, uh, but the, they have obviously a close relationship with their colleagues at the downtown site. And so those residents who are interested in um, the specialty of pulmonary critical care, uh, our faculty can refer them to downtown site for additional rotations uh, for research opportunities and for the ability to mature that interest in pulmonary critical care. Uh, the sleep lab has been moved uh, to our campus. It's on the seventh floor. Um, this, there's a sleep fellowship. Uh, so the University of Maryland Sleep Fellowship is located on our campus. There's a pulmonary rehab unit uh, that's been relocated to our hospital. It's on the fifth floor. Uh, this is a unique unit. Uh, residents don't rotate there because it's a rehab unit. But these are patients who are uh, very sick. Uh, a lot of them are ventilator dependent with respiratory failure, going through a slow weaning process. Um, uh, the complicated, uh, complicated uh, case mix, uh, patients who are st status post um, uh, transplants, lung transplants, heart transplants, liver transplants, um, very um, challenging group of patients. Uh, I help uh, work up in, in that unit. And it's, it's, uh, for me, it's uh, very, I, I, I love it because a lot of uh, complex, interesting cases, I learn a lot whenever I'm up there. Um, they have a brand new uh, psychiatry uh, unit uh, here. It's a state-of-the-art psychiatry unit. It's um, on the sixth floor of, of our hospital. Um, uh, people come from all over the region to visit it because it uh, has all the latest uh, technology of a inpatient psych unit. So we're still, we're still in this process of transforming into one academic medical center with two campuses. What's gonna happen in the future? Well, they're going to build this building, which is the new ambulatory tower. It's supposed to be finished in the summer of 2021. And uh, when that's completed, um, more clinics from the downtown will move in there. A GI clinic um, uh, will move there. Uh, it's going to be uh, the inflammatory bowel disease clinic, as well as uh, the motility clinic. Um, all the ID clinics will move in there. Uh, the chronic kidney disease center will move in there. And the focus will be on chronic disease management. Uh, right now, uh, <laughs> right now, if you were to visit our campus, this is what you're gonna see. A lot of um, construction trucks and uh, uh, a lot of noise, uh, but uh, it's going up steadily. And surely uh, it's uh, been fascinating to watch uh, this thing. It's, it's located directly right across from our uh, main, uh, main door. Uh, Dr. Mohan Santa is the CEO of the University of Maryland Medical System. So he oversees all 13 hospitals. And uh, in his, he, he has stated that uh, the strategic vision and mission of University of Maryland Medical Center, uh, which is our campus and the downtown campus, uh, that, we're, that the purpose is not for us at Midtown to be a smaller version of the downtown campus. No, uh, and that uh, the that we are still a at heart, at our root, we're a community hospital charged with providing care to those people who live in our community. Uh, the downtown campus will be is a tertiary referral center providing tertiary care to all the people in the state of Maryland. So <clears throat> the two hospitals have different uh, uh, missions, but we're unified uh, uh, and uh, joined uh, as, as, in, uh, as one institution, but with two purposes. That, by the way, Mohan Santa is a radiation oncologist, wonderful guy. Uh, 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 he's, he's really a strong, strong uh, advocate for uh, Midtown. Uh, he's he spent a lot. He's, he spends good good deal of time uh, here visiting us and 
yeah, he's gotten to know us pretty well uh, and a very strong advocate for graduate medical education. Um, so let me uh, uh, go over the program leadership with you. Uh, Ellen Marciniak is the associate program director. Uh, Ellen is a pulmonary critical care faculty. Uh, so she spends well, one week a month as the uh, attending in the ICU. Uh, she's um, uh, a, a, um, a very, uh, she's the chair of our clinical competency committee, um, a, a, a really wonderful advocate uh, and educator. Uh, Jeff uh, Gerbino, he's uh, the associate program director for ambulatory medicine. He's the uh, preceptor in the ambulatory uh, clinic uh, and um, a uh, primary care physician and general internist. Naresh Bossi is the assistant program director. He's director of the hospice program. I'll say more about the hospice program in a minute. As Sam Fredell is a DIO, designated institutional official. Every teaching hospital is a DIO and they uh, report to the ACGME. Now, Sam's the director of ophthalmology here. Uh, they've had an ophthalmology residency program here for many years. It's been, it, it's done very well. It's a very respected program. Uh, and, and, they, and they also had a residency program in ophthalmology at the downtown site. Now, uh, here at this site, the, they had a busy general ophthalmology clinic. People from around the, re, uh, around, uh, our, um, the various neighborhoods would come to our clinic, get eye care. If they needed a procedure, the residents would get involved. And it's been a very successful program. At the downtown site, they have all these uh, specialist ophthalmologists. You know, there's one for the eyelid, one for the eyebrow, one for the eyelash, one for rods, one for cones. You know how ophthalmology is. Uh, so what do they do? They combine the two residency programs. And it was a win-win. The residents were here, got to go downtown, work with all these specialist ophthalmologists. The ophthalmology residents were downtown, got to come up here, rotate through a busy general ophthalmology clinic, get involved in general ophthalmology procedures. And now Sam's the program director. Well, let me say this. He was the program director and he handed that job over just this July to a new program director. Uh, but uh, Sam was the program director for many years of this combined program. So uh, Dr. Santa, uh, uh, he said uh, to us in internal medicine, hey, why don't you guys look at combining programs? It worked well in ophthalmology. And so uh, we met, we talked about this and um, uh, we considered it. Now, the uh, downtown site has a big internal medicine program. It's like 140 to 150 residents. And if we combine the two programs, it would be like 180 residents. And they would rotate through this site for one or two months a year, uh, uh, two, one or two times a year uh, over the course of their three years if they're training in internal medicine. We felt like, gee, as faculty here, we wouldn't, wouldn't really get to know these residents they wouldn't have an attachment to this campus. And so uh, we decided to keep the two programs separate. And by keeping them separate, uh, we could provide a menu of training opportunities to applicants. So if you're an internal medicine uh, applicant and you wanted a large tertiary, tertiary referral center, big faculty, that's a better institution for you. On the other hand, if you're looking for a, uh, a more a community orientation to patient care, a smaller faculty, more intimate learning environment, this might be a better fit for you. If you're looking for a preliminary internal medicine program, they have that at the downtown site. If you're looking for a transitional year program, we have that here. So by providing this menu of training opportunities, we felt we could meet, the, meet a wider spectrum of applicants. So we've kept the programs separate. Now, let me introduce you to the faculty because uh, I think this may be insightful to see how they relate to the two campuses. Uh, so Reyes Hawk is the head of cardiology here. He's 100% he's based here at our campus uh, and uh, he's a general cardiologist um, and uh, very much enjoys uh, getting to know and working with our residents. Uh, now, um, cardiology cannot be a one person show uh, so there's four other cardiologists. Now they're based at the downtown site, but they come up here one day a week and they help uh, 
Reyes uh, with um, uh, a clinic uh, with a reading, uh, echocardiograms and, um, and, and EKGs uh, with doing consultations and taking call. But Reyes is the backbone of the cardiology program here. Uh, Evelino Vercellas is head of Palm Crit. Uh, now um, he uh, he's uh, he does one week a month as the ICU uh, attending. He also is he also spends one week a month on the pulmonary consult service. The other two weeks a month, excuse me, he's downtown. That's where his research lab is. Now he's up here a lot because uh, he's uh, he's on a lot of committees of the hospital. Um, he gives lectures to the residents. Um, he he told me that uh, there's, a, there's a shuttle bus that goes between the two campuses that runs every 15 minutes. And he told me he and the shuttle bus driver are like best friends. Uh, Steve Shen is head of nephrology and uh, he's part of the nephrology faculty, the downtown site. Um, and uh, just this year, uh, there were two other nephrologists have come up here to join him. So now there's three people uh, who help uh, staff uh, nephrology here. Um, it previously was just Steve. So now that there's two other people here, he's, you can see that's why he's smiling. Uh, Kavita Kara is head of HEMOC. Uh, she, uh, she was a resident here. Then she did her fellowship downtown and uh, now, she, and then she, after she finished fellowship, she opened a practice here across the street. Very much, a, in, very much an integral member of our faculty. Uh, she has uh, a resident rotation in her office for all third year residents. She has a, a medical student rotation in her office. She serves on multiple committees of our hospital. Uh, she runs a cancer conference, uh, which happens every month. Um, uh, so uh, important member of our faculty and we're uh, pleased that uh, um, uh, pleased to have her. Uh, Ray Kim is head of uh, GI. He's part of the GI faculty at downtown. Uh, he's one of six GI uh, uh, faculty who help staff our GI consult service. They do two weeks at a time. He's got a scared look on his face. Uh, but Ray, uh, Ray's here all the time because he's head of the endoscopy unit here. Um, so he does all his procedures here. Uh, ID is run by Pat uh, Riscavage. Uh, ID is a very um, big uh, service here. Um, a lot of, there's a big faculty. Um, all their clinic is here. Um, the, the University of Maryland is uh, well known uh, for its, um, uh, University of Maryland is well known for infectious diseases. Uh, and uh, it, it's a wonderful faculty, very skilled both uh, in terms of uh, teaching as well as in research. So we're very fortunate to have uh, Pat and his group intimately involved with our residents. Um, endocrine uh, is, uh, is run by Dr. Munier. Uh, the endocrine clinic is located uh, here. If the downtown side needs an endocrine uh, consult, they'll send someone on the bus downtown to see the patient. Rheumatology is uh, run by uh, uh, Jamal McDashi. He's part of the rheumatology faculty. Uh, he's here three days a week. Uh, one day a week, he's at the VA. The uh, VA is located across the street from the main hospital. He uh, staffs the rheumatology clinic there. And then one day a week, he uh, runs the uh, uh, rheumatology fellow clinic. Um, geriatrics is um, uh, uh, at, it's based at the VA hospital. As I mentioned, the VA is across the street from the main hospital. It's run by Jake Blumenthal. Uh, it's acquired rotation uh, for third year residents. Um, um, it's, and, uh, and, but um, J Jake has a good presence uh, here. Now, um, Dr. Lee, uh, this is her. Uh, she's very eager. So her picture showed up on this slide uh, first. Um, uh, she uh, runs the emergency medicine rotation. Uh, all interns rotate through emergency medicine for a month. Uh, it's a very well-structured rotation. Uh, the um, uh, residents have enjoyed it. There's a set of lectures you go to every um, Wednesday morning. Uh, you get assigned to different preceptors. Uh, so you get to see different styles, a set of procedures that you have to get signed off on over the course of the rotation. Um, very, uh, very well organized and uh, residents have liked that. The hospital service is run by uh, Dr. Bassi. Um, 
in addition, uh, there's um, all the transitional years do a month of general surgery. Uh, and the director of that rotation is Steve Kavik. Uh, Steve is also the program director for the general surgery residency program at the downtown site. Uh, a wonderful teacher, he's a general surgeon. Uh, and uh, when, but uh, so even though he's a program director at the downtown site, he comes up here, comes up to our site and does, and, and operates uh, one or two days a week. And he does that because of the availability of our time. But when he comes up here, he wants the transitional year uh, resident on the surgery, sur surgery rotation to scrub in with him. Um, now, uh, th there was a time uh, we had the transitional year uh, resident uh, do their general surgery on the general surgery service at the downtown site. That's a busy service. Uh, they were uh, right up, uh, they're always right up against the duty hours. Uh, they, uh, there was competition for all our time uh, with the uh, general surgery interns, with the general surgery sub eyes, with the general surgery clerkship students. And uh, so what do we do? We move the rotation up here to this site. And at this site, there's no other residents, there's no other students, there's no other sub eyes, it's just you. And in the morning you come in, you look at the OR board and you decide which procedures you're gonna scrub in on. Now, as I mentioned, if Dr. Kavik is operating, you should scrub in with him. Uh, and uh, he's, a, he, he's a wonderful teacher, and, but he'll, he has a reputation of uh, holding you accountable. He, he'll, he'll want you to f be familiar with the anatomy and sort of know what you're doing. And if you can show him your interest, uh, he'll he'll let you have a lot of autonomy in the uh, OR. Um, now, uh, Mike Lilly is head of the Department of Surgery here at Midtown. Uh, Mike's a vascular surgeon, and his philosophy is: why scrub in on a general surgery case when you can scrub in on vascular surgery? If he sees you hanging around, uh, he'll grab you by the scuff of your neck, drag you into his OR, and 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 put you to work. Uh, he uh, he likes uh, having the transitional year resident hang out with him and his team. They've got a busy uh, vascular surgery team here, and uh, and this is particularly um, attractive to those um, residents who uh, like radiology, particularly interventional radiology. Um, and Mike is uh, rather fond of trying to persuade them to go into vascular surgery instead of instead of IR. He hasn't been successful yet, but he keeps trying. And he keeps wondering why everyone's going into IR, not vascular surgery. Uh, ENT is headed by uh, Dr. Hebert, and she's um, welcoming to any resident uh, to scrub in into her uh, surgeries. <clears throat> uh, Sam uh, Ferdell, as I mentioned, he's head of ophthalmology, and he has an ophthalmology room that people people can, uh, uh, can, 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 can go into. Uh, our uh, interest is that you, you as a uh, intern, go into uh, all different uh, surgeries during your month. Uh, we want to see a variety of surgeries: orthopedic surgeries, vascular surgeries, ENT surgeries, urology surgeries. Uh, we we had the one person who was going into ophthalmology, and he kept going into the ophthalmology room. Now Sam did not kick him out. He just he he's very welcoming, but. Um, we 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 like you to get a different um, get, get get a diversity of experiences during that month. Uh, Alan Scrinta is head of uh, radiology. He's part of the radiology faculty. Um, he's hundred percent based here. Uh, there are other radiology faculty who rotate through here. Uh, there's uh, ultrasound people. There's interventional radiology people. But Alan's here hundred percent of the time. Uh, he's a wonderful uh, radiologist, loves uh, teaching residents and students. And, um, and uh, he's one of these people who he, he welcomes people coming down to his office, reviewing films with him. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a couple of, there's a couple of uh, urologists. Uh, they, um, they're, they're, they consider themselves part of our faculty. Uh, uh, they are, uh, they're, they're great guys. They've been here at this hospital for over 30 years. And uh, they, they're, 
they get to know our, all of our residents. They come to resident graduation. Uh, they love teaching our residents. Uh, really a, a very um, easygoing uh, uh, collegial uh, couple of uh, urologists and really been nice to um, work with them. All right, well, uh, I don't know who these people are. Actually, uh, this, she is the uh, chief resident in ophthalmology now. She was a, a TY intern with us. Uh, he uh, uh, was a, Jay was a TY intern with us. Now he's uh, part of the radiology residency program at the University of Maryland downtown uh, campus. The trouble is when you're a TY, you have to work with this kind of, uh, he's one of our categorical residents. I don't know who these people are. Um, so there's four war teams. Uh, on two of the teams, there's one resident, two interns, and uh, two students. And then on two of the teams, there's one resident, one intern, and one to two students. And there's a night float team. Night float is one resident, one intern, one student. And if you're on a long call, then you stay uh, uh, here until 7 p.m. You come in at seven in the morning, you stay until 7 p.m. At 7 p.m. you sign out to the night float. If you're not on long call and three nights out of four, you're not on long call, then you come in at seven in the morning and then you sign out to a long call team about between four to five. So the ro teams rotate being on long call. Hope that makes sense. Uh, so here's a, a sort of a schema of the four teams. Uh, now the orange team, uh, this uh, the cap on this team is uh, eight, uh, soon to go to seven. <clears throat> and uh, this is the IMC team. IMC is the intermediate care unit. Uh, these patients are, they're not quite sick enough for the ICU, but they're uh, too sick for the regular medical floor. So that's why the cap is, uh, seven. The blue team, the cap is 10. And the, uh, the, uh, see the, the people who admit to the blue team are, uh, there's about four, uh, four uh, doctors in private practice who admit to the blue team. Uh, so that the attendings for the patients on the blue team will be private physicians. And they all uh, conduct, uh, participate in conducting uh, teaching rounds with that team. The purple team, the gold team, these are hospitalist teams. So the attending is a hospitalist and uh, the cap on these teams is 18. Now uh, teams accept admissions in serial fashion, which means all teams get new patients every day. And there's a cap of four new patients per team per day. Um, Excuse me, uh, uh, because, uh, because um, the goal team, uh, the, one of the interns would take the admissions one day and then the next day the other intern would take admissions. Uh, so cap of four new patients per team uh, per day. Now there's a night flow team. Night flow emits a total of five patients overnight. And uh, these patients count towards a total of four new patients uh, per team per day. So I'll show you how this works. Um, let's, uh, 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 let's suppose that uh, night float admitted uh, five patients last night, and then uh, one patient uh, went to the blue team, one patient uh, went to the orange team, and uh, two patients went to uh, purple team, and one patient went to the gold team. So two, one, one, one. And uh, so let's say that you were on the, uh, the you were on the, uh, the, the, the purple team and uh, there's two interns on the purple team. So each of them would get new one, would get uh, one patient each uh, from a uh, knife float. Uh, and if the t purple team decided to divide up the emissions uh, each day, then each of those two interns would get one more additional patient new patient over the course of the day. And once they get one more new patient each, then the team will reach its cap of four new admissions for the day. Hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. 
Um, now, oh, let me say this. Uh, um, bef when I first got here, the night flow cap was 10. 10. And um, I thought, gee, that's a lot. Because the night flow, not only do they have to cross cover, um, not only do they have to admit new patients overnight, they also have to cross cover the medicine surface. So I said to the residents, gee, let's cut down the night flow cap from 10 to five. What do you think the residents said? Well, they said, Dr. Chow, if you insist, we'll go along with it. Um, so that, but the residents are not the ones you have to convince. Who do you have to convince? It's the people who would take the overflow admissions. It's the hospitalists. Now let me tell you about hospitalists. Hospitalists all over this country, every hospital in this country, I guarantee you, they're all beholden to the same incentives, the same metrics, the same contracts. What are those metrics? It's length of stay of their patients in the hospital, rate of readmission of their patients within 30 days, a patient satisfaction scores, um, a rate of uh, centralized social infections, rate of uh, urinary catheter infections, uh, rate of C. diff infections. Uh, where do you get this stuff? Medicare. Uh, Medicare has said to hospitals, this is how we're going to pay you. We're going to modulate your pay based on, on, uh, on, these, uh, on your adherence to these metrics, patient satisfaction scores, uh, length of uh, uh, rate of readmissions, uh, hospital acquired infections, and so forth. Uh, that's why uh, at all the hospitals where you all rotate, and you've seen this, admit it, you'll, you've seen this, Tremendous pressure to get patients out of the hospital, right? And that's because of these, uh, these, uh, these, uh, because of the way that the Medicare incentives are aligned. Uh, so, uh, so if I had gone to the hospitals at the hospital where I was before I, I got here, and I said to those guys, "Hey, I want to reduce the night flow cap from ten to five, they would have laughed at me. They would have said, "Hey, what are you talking about? How could that help?" How is that going to help us reduce length of stay, reduce rates of readmissions, uh, reduce the uh, uh, improved patient satisfaction scores? Uh, so um, it would enough. It, 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 it would it would have not uh, uh, would have not flown. Uh, so uh, when I got here, I didn't have a lot of hope. Uh, but I talked to our hospitals here, and they said, "Hey, good idea. We'll support it. We'll help." So I thought to myself, "Gee, what's going on here? Do these hospitals have a different contract?" than every hospitalist in this country? So I checked, no, same contract. So then I scratched my head, I wonder what's going on here? Turns out the hospitalists here, not only were they all former residents here, they're all former chief residents here. This is their program. This is their, the, this is their legacy. They wanna see the residents do well. They wanna see the residents succeed. So fortunately we have close alignment between the, the, our residency program and the hospital's program. Because at the end of the day, a hospital's program is a clinical enterprise with clinical metrics, uh, clinical goals. A residency program is an educational enterprise with educational goal, educational mission. And because of the different nature of these types of programs, sometimes they don't always align. Uh, so in terms of residency uh, coverage, uh, the four Teams, as I mentioned, they take, take turn being on long call throughout the month. Uh, uh, teams have, uh, they have either Saturday or Sunday off, so they get one day off a week. And uh, the award interns are on long call every four days with the team. Uh, now, this is the transitional year schedule. Uh, three and a half months on the wards, half month of night flow, two and a half months in the ICU. ICU CC is a combined unit here. One month of emergency medicine, as I mentioned. Uh, ambulatory block is uh, where you rotate through general surgery um, subspecialty clinics. Uh, there's ENT clinic, ophthalmology clinic, urology clinic, orthopedic clinic. Uh, and then there's a month of general surgery, as I mentioned, and then two and a half electives. Now, uh, for uh, comparison, no, well, let, so let me say this. Um, starting next year, uh, four of our transitional year residents are going to be 
doing their transitional year with us and then going on to the ophthalmology program at University of Maryland. The you know, ophthalmology is, uh, is uh, combining uh, the, the internship into its program to become an integrated categorical program. So our transitional year was going to be part of their program. So for those four ophthalmology bound residents for our program, this is what their schedule is going to look like. And it's quite, it's almost exactly the same. And, and that's on purpose. It's almost exactly the same as the other transitional year residents. Uh, they have three months of ophthalmology and these three months replaces the half month of ambulatory block that the other transitional year residents get, the one month of general surgery and the one and a half months of uh, elective. Okay. Now, uh, then in addition to comp for comparison, uh, here is what the categorical internal medicine resident schedule looks like. And there's four months of wards. They get a month of night float, one and a half months of ICU, uh, one month of endocrinology and a half month of ambulatory block, two electives. They have something called a quality improvement block. Um, but uh, in, in general, it pretty much is the same as the transitional year schedule. And that's on purpose. Now they have four months of wards, the transitional year interns have three. And uh, because um, uh, um, there was a time when the transitional year residents were assigned to the general surgery ward at the downtown campus. And so that was, we thought that was a ward month. So that's why the categoricals do four months of medicine wards and the transitional years do three general medicine wards and one month of general surgery. But now the general surgery uh, month is no longer a ward experience. Uh, the general surgery block here, there's no weekends, there's no call. <clears throat> so functionally or duty hour wise, it's more like an elective. Don't tell the categorical interns that. Uh, so the categorical, uh, the, 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 see the transitional year uh, residents have two and a half months of ICU. Um, now the ICU is uh, done in shifts, uh, done in 12 hour shifts as is night float. So the PG, uh, the categorical uh, have, uh, have they, they have one month of night float. Transitional year interns have half month of night float. Um, so we felt like that was uh, you know, these 12 hour, 12 hour shifts. We, we thought that was, um, help balance that out. Um, so it, it, our, our interest is that um, that at the end of the day, people feel like um, everyone is working hard and working at the same level because uh, we, we want it to feel like it's not us and them, uh, that everyone is in the same boat, everybody's rowing with the same vigor. And when that happens, then the boat goes in a straight direction. Uh, and uh, we, and, and, and you've seen this. Yeah, you've maybe you've been in positions where you feel like you're working uh, really hard, and then the person uh, next to you maybe isn't uh, working as hard, and you feel like, gosh, um, you feel like uh, all the all all the, all the responsibility is on you, um, and that's not fun. But when everybody's pulling together, everybody's working hard, then uh, that's where uh, the job seems to be much easier. That uh, and you get to the top of the mountain faster uh, and the sense of teamwork, a sense of collegiality. And uh, so we want the interns to feel like we're all, all interns together, uh, the categorical internal medicine interns, the ophthalmology interns, the transitional year interns, everybody is uh, all one confluent integrated class. Uh, this is the weekly ward schedule. Um, uh, seven o'clock in the morning, uh, you come to the hospital, night float will sign out to you. Um, there's a 7.30, 9.30, they do something called pre-rounds. I'm not exactly sure what that is. I see them walking around drinking coffee. 9.30 to 12, there's attending rounds. Uh, and then 12 to one is noon conference. 
Right now, noon conference is uh, virtual, and you're going to uh, see that uh, today. Um, and then sign out rounds at four between four and four thirty. Now on uh, Thursdays at noon, uh, we have uh, either grand rounds uh, or M and M. And then uh, on uh, Tuesday mornings, we have a case conference, and this is where uh, each of the different each of the war teams take turn presenting a case that that they've encountered, um, they share the case, they do it in a problem solving uh, uh, manner. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, all the residents get involved and uh, they try to stump each other. Um, they always stump me. It's, uh, they have, these are sometimes are crazy cases, but it's, it's, uh, it's always um, uh, a very lively discussion. Um, so this is the downtown Baltimore and the Inner Harbor. You can park your boat here, uh, visit the sites. That's the National Aquarium. Now, uh, when you go around and you look at the various one-year programs, uh, be, be sure that you pay close attention to who your supervising resident is going to be. Uh, because these people are going to be ones who are going to primarily be the ones teaching you. Um, they... Uh, there was a survey quite a few years ago uh, of um, interns at the end of the year in terms of uh, how much uh, you learned uh, from each group of uh, teachers. And the 75% of the teaching that happened, they thought occurred uh, from their supervising resident, 25% from the faculty. And I guess that's probably reasonable because uh, you spend a lot of time with the supervising faculty, not as much time, not not as much time with the faculty. So it's important to to to, to figure out who these supervising residents are going to be, and are these people, uh, the folks who you feel comfortable learning from, hanging out with, um, and uh, uh, st uh, studying with. Now, um, uh, so in terms of our uh, categorical residents, uh, one of the core values is teaching. Um, we're at the end of the first year, we have a workshop uh, for the categorical residents on teaching residents how to teach. Uh, we teach them on uh, how to give feedback uh, on uh, leading uh, uh, work rounds. And um, we hope that no matter what they do in their future careers, no matter what they go into, that teaching will be part of their core values, part of their skill set, uh, part of their career aspirations. Uh, so I was mentioning this to one of the uh, transitional year applicants uh, about uh, three years ago. And he said uh, to me, hey, um, how come you don't have this for the transitional year uh, uh, residents? And I thought to myself, you know, you're right. Uh, the transitional year residents are involved in teaching medical students. Uh, we should do this for the transi transitional year uh, residents. So we do this. So now we, we're doing, we, we have a one day uh, retreat in uh, October uh, each year for the transitional year interns. And um, we discuss uh, teaching uh, skills. Uh, we discuss how to give good lectures, uh, uh, conflict negotiation uh, and, uh, and, 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 and other topics like that. Uh, and, that and they seem to enjoy that retreat. Uh, so in terms of conferences, uh, the, the we have most of our noon conferences are given by subspecialty faculty. Uh, and uh, what we've done is to take Harrison's textbook of medicine, divided out all the topics in Harrison's. And it turns out we can cover all the topics in one and a half years. So over three years, each topic is covered twice. So for internal medicine uh, uh, residents, uh, hopefully they can go to each topic at least once. Now, um, if you're uh, here for just one year, uh, you won't be able to hear every topic in Harrison's, but you, you'll be able to hear a good number of them. Um, emergency medicine does one topic a month. Those residents on ambulatory block, uh, they uh, come together once a month and give ambulatory presentations. m and is twice a month, Grand Rounds twice a month. Uh, tumor board, which is cancer conferences once a month and journal club is once a month. Here's uh, when we were having uh, in-person conferences. Um, uh, now it's virtual, but uh, this does give us an opportunity to renovate our conference room. And so we're in the, we're in the process of totally renovating 
the resident conference room. Uh, so uh, this is the simulation lab. It's located at the downtown site. We have access to it. Well, we don't have access to it right now because it's closed related to the pandemic, uh, but um, hopefully it'll open up soon and uh, we can go back to the uh, to using the uh, the the, the uh, sim lab uh, this the sim lab uh, we uh, have a curriculum uh, in simulation and this was born out of the interest of one of our categorical residents he wanted to create a simulation curriculum and so he did under the supervision of one of our critical care faculty and now once a month a group of residents will go down there and they will learn uh, it's mostly procedures, procedures in the sim lab under the supervision of a critical care fellow. Uh, and they uh, were doing this once a month. Um, here's a, a group of them. And uh, here they're participating in a, a mega code. Uh, the, the residents enjoy this. And, and because of our sort of regular use of the sim lab, the sim lab director feels that he told me our program uses this sim lab uh, to a greater extent than uh, what the residents of the downtown site do. Uh, we have a uh, ultrasound device. This is the ultrasound device, not this one, although he thinks he is. Um, we are uh, in the process of uh, purchasing uh, two uh, handheld ultrasound devices for the floors. The, there's an ultrasound device like this one in the ER. Um, and uh, we're developing an ultrasound curriculum. Again, one of the residents is helping us develop that curriculum. Um, uh, uh, and uh, we hope that the residents, who, those who are interested, can become facile with uh, using uh, ultrasound and point of care. All right, what we're not. Uh, we're not a fellow-dominated program. Now, there is a pulmonary critical care fellow in the ICU, and uh, that's, uh, that's been very helpful. Uh, in the ICU, the ICU attending comes in the morning, conducts rounds on all the patients, and then that person leaves. And then, but the fellow stays behind, the fellow helps the residents with uh, procedures, helps the resident with the new admissions. Um, and, uh, uh, and uh, but at nighttime that uh, fellow leaves and then the residents um, have access to a, uh, e-care, electronic uh, ICU uh, consultation service. Uh, there's cameras uh, and monitors in every room, and uh, um, and and that's been uh, that's been helpful. But have these critical care fellows have been very instrumental in teaching our residents in the ICU setting, and uh, our residents have uh, very much enjoyed working with them. But otherwise, on the floors. Um, you call for a cardiology consult, the cardiologist comes to your patient, cardiologist will call you, discuss the case with you. You'll have their cell phone numbers. Same thing with uh, like nephrology. Uh, you call for a nephrology consult, nephrologist will come see the patient, they'll call you. Um, you'll, you, you can text them uh, an interesting blood gas. You can text the cardiologist an interesting EKG, they'll go over with you. Uh, you'll have a very, close and informal relationship with all of these uh, faculty. Uh, we're not a medical school. We don't have to administer a medical school, which is a lot of work. Um, on the other hand, um, uh, we have medical students here on every, uh, on, 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 on every service. Uh, we have students from University of Maryland School of Medicine, um, and we have students from American University of Antigua. And uh, so all the consult services, the ICU service, they're populated with students. And we think that's all to the good. Uh, that's, uh, I think that enhances the resident training experience. We don't have on-site research labs here and there's no intent to bring on-site research labs to the site, especially since they built a brand new research building downtown. On the other hand, those residents who are interested in doing research especially bench research, that those opportunities would be available but at the downtown site. We don't do bypass surgery here. We don't do transplants here. Uh, we don't do bone marrow transplants here. Uh, if you're interested in those types of technologies, those type of procedures, um, that won't be, uh, this won't be the program for you. 
Now, if you were uh, a patient who came to our hospital and you had acute coronary syndrome, um, uh, you, the, uh, you, you would come to our ED. The ED would call it Uber for you. No, they wouldn't call it Uber for you, but they, they, they would transport you to the downtown site. At the downtown site there, they would uh, angioplasty your coronary artery. They would stent it. They would massage it, whatever they do. Uh, but they won't do that. Those, 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 um, those interventional procedures here because uh, we don't have uh, bypass availability uh, here. Um, um, to, to address that need, uh, we've uh, had, we created a rotation at the downtown site for our residents, uh, but that's in the third year for them to learn interventional cardiology and be exposed to it. Uh, you, you will, however, see a lot of cardiology cases here because it's prevalent in the community. Uh, as an intern, uh, you'll, you'll feel very comfortable managing uh, heart failure, uh, managing chest pain. Uh, but in terms of being exposed to interventional cardiology, uh, that, that you won't uh, see that uh, here at this campus. Uh, we don't have sub-subspecialists sub, sub in every field. What I mean by that is, uh, so we have gastrologist here, but we don't have a pancreatologist. We don't have a duodenologist. We have cardiologists here, but we don't have left atriumologist. Um, now, um, we, we, we've had residents rotate downtown on the heart failure service. Uh, it's a busy service. Uh, these are very sick patients with advanced heart failure. They're on, they're on, uh, they're on balloon pumps, they're on LVATs. Uh, basically, these patients are online waiting for transplant. Um, same thing with uh, uh, the liver service downtown. Uh, the hepatologists run that liver service, the very busy liver service. Uh, they're in line waiting for transplant. University of Maryland is, I don't know, it's like number three in the country in the number of liver transplants that they do. And uh, so it's a very busy liver service. Residents have enjoyed rotating down there, but uh, those types of uh, patient populations and diseases, they're not going to be located on this campus. So what's unique? Well, uh, this program is it's, it's valued by the institution. The, this hospital sponsors the categorical and tone medicine program and the transitional program, and they've sponsored those two programs for the past 60 years. Uh, the hospital is very vested in the good and welfare of those programs and our residents. Um, every, um, every month I have to meet with the president of this hospital. Every month I meet with the chief medical officer of this hospital. Uh, twice a month I meet with the chief of medicine, chair of medicine at the downtown site. First thing they always ask me is, hey, how are the residents doing? Anything we can do to help? Very supportive of our residency program. And um, that's not, uh, it's not necessarily universal around the country. Our, uh, our perspective is that we want this to be a resident run program. Hey, it's much more fun that way. I wanna feel like I'm sitting in the back of the bus. I want the residents sitting in the front of the bus, uh, driving us forward, uh, taking us uh, in new directions. Um, uh, and, uh, that, um, uh, and, and so we want them to feel like they're in the driver's seat. So I'll give you an example of this. Uh, like I mentioned, the simulation uh, curriculum I'm not a simulationologist. I don't know much about that. I'm a general internist. Uh, one of the residents uh, had an interest in it. He developed the curriculum, he instituted it, and uh, now it's, uh, uh, it's going full steam. Um, we, um, uh, we have a resident who is also, who is interested in resident wellness. And uh, again, I'm not an expert in this, but she um, uh, worked with another member of our faculty. She. Uh, spearheaded uh, some initiatives in resident wellness, um, and uh, it was a uh, uh, it, it, it's a very important initiative. Now um, we have uh, we have some programs, uh, some we have a lecture series. Um, we had um, we, we have we have a survey that residents take um, uh, twice a year on burnout. Um, but th these are initiatives that uh, that residents have uh, come up with. And uh, I'm grateful for their interest and for their uh, passion in, um, make, in moving our program forward. Um, it's a small program. We want you to feel like it's your program and that you can make a difference here. 
And you can also make a difference to, to the hospital and you can make it better. So um, I'll give you an example of this. Uh, one of our uh, re residents, so all residents get assigned to uh, committees. Um, and um, it, uh, we feel like the, one of the things we want you to be able, what we want you to do is to work on your leadership skills. And the way to do that is give you some leadership administrative experience is by having you serve on a committee of the hospital. All hospitals work through committees. And so here at this hospital, we have a lot of different committees. That the, um, they've, they've, there's a critical care committee, uh, there's a pharmacy committee, um, there's the education committee, um, there's, um, there's a large number of them and uh, you pick and choose which one you would like to um, uh, work on. So, uh, so I'll give you an example. We had a um, transitional year intern and he was on the critical care committee and the, um, uh, the blood bank made a presentation to the critical care committee uh, once uh, one day and they said, you know, um, a lot of blood is being transfused up here. Uh, here, uh, the, here's the month of March and look at all these units and month of May, here's all these units of blood and here's June, all these units of blood and gee, there's a lot of blood being transfused up here. And the critical, and the members of that committee shook their heads and they looked at each other and uh, they uh, couldn't quite account for this. But the intern said, hey, look, this is not rocket science. Uh, every morning, uh, every patient gets a handful of tubes of blood drawn. Then in the afternoon, they get another handful of tubes drawn. And then you wonder why they're anemic. And then he said to the rest of the members of the committee, hey, why don't you use pediatric tubes? And the members of the committee looked at each other and they said, what's that? Because we don't have peds here. They have, the members of the committee haven't seen pediatric tubes uh, uh, since they were in medical school. And so the intern said, well, let me look into this. And uh, he found that the uh, price of the pediatric tube is the same as the price of regular tubes. So that was good. Then he went down to the lab and uh, he, he, he found that uh, by checking the manual that uh, yes, the machines in the lab could accommodate pediatric tubes he had to knock the cobwebs off a couple of the switches. And if you flip the switch, the, it would, you could put the pediatric tube in there. Uh, so that, that was great, right? Well, uh, well, not so fast. So he had to go, he had to go through a um, IRB process uh, in order to do a study to prove that the results you get using pediatric tubes, the same as the result you get using regular tubes. That was a headache because he had to get, go through the IRB training, which I, I'm, I'm sure many of you have done that. That's a big headache. And then uh, he had to write a informed consent. Patients had to sign it. Uh, the phlebotomy team, they, they agreed to work with him. So when patients signed the consent, uh, they, they would draw a little pediatric tube. Same time they drew a regular tube. The lab ran these specimens side by side. And lo and behold, the numbers look pretty good. So he showed me the numbers and I said, gee, these look pretty good but we had to prove it. So then we went down to uh, the School of Public Health. We know one of the faculty there and we asked her, Can you, what do we do to prove that these numbers are, uh, are accurate uh, and equivalent? And she gave us a correlation to use and, and uh, the numbers were very strongly um, uh, correlated. So, um, and then what happened? Well, the that transition year intern graduated and the lab director retired. So, um, so it's sort of, uh, so it's, that's sort of where the project uh, is, uh, I, have, I guess I have to hold myself responsible. I should have tried to be more aggressive about pushing it forward. Uh, but the, in terms of implementation, uh, we're, at, we're at that stage. Um, but the, it, but this is an example of how you as a resident, you can uh, take ownership of a project, see it through. Uh, the, res, this, the hospital is very uh, supportive of uh, uh, resident projects because in the end, uh, we're not necessarily supporting the resident. We're supporting providing higher quality care to our patients. That's what we're all about. And uh, you'll find that it's very easy to get stuff done here. Um, the 
the the the uh, the quality department, all the all the departments, very supportive of our training program. Now, one question that uh, we get asked is, "Hey, what are you what, what are you looking for in a candidate?" Um, and um, um, it's uh, not um, uh, it's it, it is uh, what we're looking for is our, our qualitative attributes. Uh, looking for folks who've demonstrated initiative, intellectual curiosity, self-discipline, self-motivation, resourcefulness, drive, ability to work as a member of the team. So I know these are um, sort of abstract, so let me get, give you an example. It's just one example. Uh, so uh, we had a transitional year intern and he was interested in, uh, uh, well, uh, he, he's going into radiation oncology. And uh, so um, uh, he, he, I met with him beginning, beginning of the year and I said, hey, Greg, uh, you're going into radiation oncology. You know, we've got a busy a general oncology clinic here. You get good exposure, see a lot of community-based types of cancer. And he said, no, I'm good with that. Uh, so I said, gee, what elective do you want to take? And he said, I want to do uh, neurology. Uh, and I, I said, why do you want to do that? He said, I want to hone my neuro examination skills. So he did that. And uh, that was, uh, so that was good. In the middle of the year, I met with him and I said, hey, Greg, you know, we got this uh, proton therapy thing at University of Maryland. Uh, it's uh, one of the few proton centers in the country. And, it cost, I don't know, $300 million, and they put it underneath the city of Baltimore, and it can zap the flea off the back of a buffalo from uh, 500 yards. And he said, uh, no, I, I'm good with that. I want to do infectious disease. I said, oh, why do you want to do infectious disease elective? And he said, I want to know uh, more about antibiotic prescribing. I want to be a, a steward of um, antibiotic use. I said, great. So he did that. So he was someone who sort of was able to identify uh, what he perceived to be his weaknesses, look for ways to shore those up. And you know, it shows a lot of um, uh, uh, motivation on his part, but also insight on his part. Um, and uh, at, at the end of the day, um, our interest is not to show people or push people to do one thing or another. Uh, we provide them with tools, but our perspective is, you all are adults. You should be treated like adults. And adult learners are responsible for their own education. Now, it's possible to come here, meet the requirements of the program, uh, and put it in a sort of cruise control, go, go through the year, um, and uh, be successful, graduate. Uh, but that's, uh, that's not fun for us. Uh, the fun part is that we provide you, we provide some resources, uh, and then we see where you take it. Uh, and uh, you all have come this far in your training uh, by want of your own initiative, your motivation, and it shouldn't stop during your internship. That you continue to drive yourself, you continue to push, um, challenge yourself, uh, and, uh, and and that uh, as you know, any experience, the more you put into it. Um, the more you get out of it. And that's how we view the internship experience for you. Uh, we had another intern and uh, he was going into uh, physical medicine and rehabilitation. Uh, so um, he, uh, there was some kind of a national meeting uh, that they convened twice a year. He submitted an abstract uh, to that meeting. It was accepted. So he went to that meeting, presented his abstract uh, and um, somehow, <laughs> He got involved with the resident committee of physical medicine rehabilitation, the national organization. And uh, somehow he got himself elected to be a chair of that resident committee. <laughs> and then, uh, so all throughout the year, he would, um, they would send him uh, position papers uh, about different policies, uh, uh, about approaches to uh, controversies, uh, and conflicts that occurred in medicine over the course of the year. And uh, so he would go around with our residents and say, hey, do you, hey guys, what do you think about this topic? What do you think we should, how residents feel about this? 
And then uh, he would respond back to the national organization uh, with an opinion. Uh, it, it, was, it was really fun to see his, uh, the maturation of his, um, of his leadership skills over the course of the year. And, uh, and, he, and, he, and during, he went on to do residency in PMNR and, uh, was, and he kept in touch with me and he, he, he got quite involved with the national organization. Um, and it, it was great to, great to see that he, when he started out, it was a busy year for him, that, that internship year, no doubt, it was a busy year. Uh, but something that he um, uh, he, he enjoyed, something that uh, uh, he challenged himself to do, and uh, I think he he still reflects back as uh, that year being uh, he said the more, one of the most fulfilling uh, fulfilling experiences of his uh, prof of his uh, professional career. All right, so there are some requirements. What are the requirements? One, there's clinic. All right. Uh, one afternoon a week, there's a clinic. Why is there a clinic? Uh, because the categorical interns have clinic. So transitional year interns have clinic. And it's an ampullary clinic, and it's uh, in a primary care uh, setting. At, in May of the academic year, you present a poster at the uh, Maryland ACP chapter meeting. And this is uh, a, is a case, case report. Uh, over the course of the year, you're gonna, you, you'll have many interesting cases, and you pick one, and you pre you you present that case. Now, um, uh, look, you already did the H and P. Uh, maybe there's an interesting X-ray. Maybe there's an interesting EKG. And you, know, you throw that on the poster. You throw your H and P on the poster. Next thing you know, you got a poster. Um, some people have after they presented the poster, they've uh, then written up the content of that poster into a manuscript and submitted it for publication. Um, heck, you've got the H&P, you got the x-ray, write it up and submit it. And um, uh, yeah, um, people have got it, gotten it um, accepted for, uh, for a publication. And that's, that's been, that's been, uh, that's been fun. It's cr this is a crazy meeting, by the way. It's like two, over 200 posters. All the residents in the city of Baltimore come. Uh, they present. Uh, it's it, there's a competition. Um, last uh, uh, last couple of years, uh, we've had um, a resident in the finals uh, in the poster competition uh, every year for the past three years. Uh, oh, uh, so we want you to complete. The Institute for Healthcare Improvement, there's a quality improvement modules. It's online. You do it during your inventory block. And then we want you to participate in a quality insurance project. All right, you don't have to do a project. You participate in it. Uh, I think it's a lot to ask for you to complete a project. But we just want you to be part of a quality improvement team. And uh, you, there's a lot of projects going on. The, resin, the categorical residents are all conducting projects. You can join one of their teams. Uh, but and then at the end of the year, you uh, submit a one-page write-up about uh, what was the problem that this project was supposed to address, uh, what um, what was the results, uh, what you got out of it. It's not war and peace; it's just the one-page write-up. We put that into your folder. Uh, you're also, uh, as I mentioned, you're a member of a committee. At the end of the year, you uh, submit a one-page write-up about what was the charge of the committee, uh, what. Uh, what uh, initiatives you contributed to, what you got out of the experience. It's not war and peace. Uh, and we put that in your folder. All right, so those are the requirements of the TY year. All right, um, we do have a soccer team. It's not a great soccer team. We have to play the other residencies in town. The University of Maryland has like 150 residents. Johns Hopkins has 160. We have to play those teams. I told the guys, you got to practice, practice, practice. And they told me, Dr. Cho, we're practicing. I said, what are you guys doing? They're playing Xbox soccer. All right, anyway, so we don't win, but we have a good time. Uh, they, so they borrowed the trophy, and they took a picture as if they won. But anyways, I think we had the best shirts. Uh, they took a long time designing the shirt, Midtown United. Uh, so where have previous TYs gone? So uh, 
so here, uh, this is a smattering of uh, PM&R, neurology, radiology, anesthesia back in 2015, 2016. Uh, we had a couple people, people go to family medicine, a couple of people use uh, the TY year as a springboard to internal medicine training. Um, but in 2017, look at this. We have a whole boatload of people going to radiology. Do we need that many radiologists in this country? I don't think so. Uh, then in 2018, look at this. We have all these people going to ophthalmology. Do we need that many ophthalmologists in this country? Well, I guess everybody has eyeballs. 2018, switch back to radiology. And uh, uh, 2020, um, we have, we had a couple of people uh, that now radiology is divided into interventional radiology and diagnostic radiology. Um, uh, so um, that's, it is, uh, it is what it is. Now um, in uh, 2019, one of the transitional year interns for her QI project, she conducted a survey of the, of the previous TY residents over the past uh, four, past five years. So there's 53 TY residents um, and uh, that who uh, in our program and 37 people responded to the survey. So that's a 70% response rate. And so um, these were the five years. Um, so people from all five years responded and the majority of the respondents were radiology people, some ophthalmology people. Okay, so this is a, the demographics of the respondents in her survey. And the survey results, uh, so 95% of the residents said they would choose the TY internship again. 97% uh, they would advise future applicants uh, in, uh, to consider a TY internship, uh, I think as opposed to a preliminary internal medicine internship. And then 86% uh, of residents reported that TY internship helped affirm the decision to pursue a chosen specialty. I'm not sure exactly what that means. Maybe that means that uh, uh, they're glad that they're doing their subspecialty and not internal medicine. I don't know. But anyways, uh, Hannah is the, she's a radiology resident at the University of Maryland downtown. And she, uh, con one who, she was the one who conducted this uh, survey. Um, so just to finish with a word about Baltimore. Uh, the Inner Harbor area is a very festive area especially in the summertime, a lot of activities uh, 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 go on there. Um, the uh, cra crab is the food of Baltimore. Um, they're not easy to eat, you need special instruments. Don't worry, we have a simulation lab for that. This is the Baltimore Art Museum. Orioles are a baseball team. They have the distinction of being the worst team in baseball for the past three years. Uh, Orioles Stadium, Camden Yards is only uh, less than a mile away from our hospital. It's a wonderful venue for baseball, but unfortunately, the team is uh, <clears throat> team has fallen on some hard times. Uh, Ravens are a football team. Um, they're uh, th hey, w when you come to Baltimore, we're going to convert you over uh, to be a, a part of Ravens Nation. Uh, I, I hope this is this is part of our selection criteria we i hope there's no pittsburgh steeler fans among 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 you all uh we can pretty much tolerate anything but we can't deal with pittsburgh steeler people uh so we as i mentioned we have our soccer team look they're supposed to be practicing what are they doing to sit around eating a lot of eating goes on around here this is a uh, uh look there's more eating um, they, they do a lot of social activities outside the hospital. Now, this is one, of course, when we could socialize. Um, oh, we have a medical jeopardy team. Our medical jeopardy team, uh, they've, um, uh, we compete against the other residencies in town. There's nine, there's nine other residencies in town and two out of the last three years we won. So then we would go to the nationals and represent uh, Maryland at the nationals. Okay, so um, came to the end here. So be sure to uh, take a look at the fac faculty video. Um, there's, I uh, hope that uh, you enjoy new conference uh, with our residents. Uh, hope you, you enjoy the vi virtual tour. 
very important session is a debriefing session with residents. Hope that you are taking some notes uh, uh, during this overview and hopefully you have some questions you can uh, ask the residents. Um, they've been on point to be forthcoming, candid, um, uh, and, uh, and, and, and not to hold back. Um, and uh, I should mention there's no need for any kind of follow-up correspondence. I don't feel like you have to uh, correspond with us, but if you do have questions, uh, do you have any concerns, anything we can address, please don't hesitate to contact us. We're glad to um, uh, communicate with you. Uh, but uh, in, we try to keep in line with the um, ARIS uh, guidelines in terms of uh, correspondence with uh, candidates. Okay, uh, so I will uh, finish there. I wanna thank you for your attention. I know it's a long, um, uh, you, you can wake up that person there who's uh, nodding off. <laughs> uh, I know it's a long uh, presentation um, and uh, thank you for your for hanging in there. Look forward to speaking with you during the time of your interview. Uh, goodbye.